Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. I've been very impressed with the ability to assess patients properly, even new patients, through telemedicine. During the pandemic, Mayo Clinic ramped up its telehealth and digital information and consumer technologies to better serve patients. Today, orthopedic surgeons are using telemedicine to give patients access to healthcare services remotely and to help them manage their care. It's been a real blessing for our practice and for the patients is to really focus on the connection. The relationship between a patient and a doctor or their team is, is so, so critical to everything and certainly the success of their treatment. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. If you turn in to, tune into the podcast often, you know that I love to look for silver linings. In healthcare, one of the biggest changes we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic is the expansion of telemedicine. And for many patients, this represents a silver lining. It's an improvement in how we deliver care here at Mayo Clinic. Virtual visits have been used in many specialties, including orthopedics and orthopedic surgery. Here with us to discuss are two Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeons today, Dr. Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo and Dr. Shauna Driscoll. Thanks for being here today, gentlemen. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, I have to say that I think it will be interesting to our listeners and to me to hear how you can use virtual visits in a surgical practice. So, um, Sean, would you mind telling us a little bit about your practice? Sure, I would. Uh, and, and by the way, the silver lining, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I guess we'll get to that uh, as we go on in the discussion. So Wonderful. my practice is uh, principally in the area of elbow surgery and shoulder surgery. A majority of my patients are what we call tertiary referral, meaning that they've been referred uh, from another center, from another orthopedic surgeon, typically um, for a more complex matter. And so typically they do travel uh, some distance, sometimes quite a distance. And um, in that regard, this patient population has been, I think, particularly uh, beneficially impacted by COVID-induced uh, changes in uh, telemedicine. Joaquin, tell us a little about your practice, please. Thank you very much again. So my practice is similar to Dr. Driscoll. I do a mostly shoulder and elbow surgery. And like him, I uh, do take of care of patients that uh, come from all over the country or all over the world. Uh, and that's why I think telemedicine has been such a major uh, beneficial impact uh, in my practice currently. So my practice includes anything from shoulder arthroplasty to rotator cuff repair to elbow arthroscopy to elbow arthroplasty. And uh, one of the hallmarks of Mayo Clinic, as we all know, is that we take care of very complex patients that sometimes have been searching around in other places and don't get an answer. So they come to us because of the complexity level of their problem. I think it might fascinate some of our listeners just to hear that there are two surgeons who specialize just in elbows and shoulders. Uh, that's pretty amazing. I think that's a pretty specialized uh, practice. There are that many elbows and shoulders to operate on. Well, actually, I do the left elbow and he does the right elbow. <laughs> <laughs> that's really specialized. <laughs> What's interesting, Elena, is that the field of shoulder surgery and elbow surgery keeps expanding. You know, so to your point, maybe two decades ago it was less common, but currently there are a lot of patients that need help. And we have procedures now that maybe were not offered in the past. And that's why the volume and the complexity of our practice has continued to increase over time. That's really interesting because in a lot of the areas where we discuss topics on Q&A, we talk about the fact that it really behooves patients to go to centers where many, many of these uh, procedures or surgeries are done because the people have such incredible, you know, our surgeons and our procedurals have such expertise in the areas where they work. And I imagine that's true in orthopedics as well. Yeah, that, that, that's very true, Helena. And we have a, a special blessing here because um, we're part of a team who do um, uh, these similar types of procedures. And so we sit together there in the dictating area and where we see our patients and where we operate. And we're constantly discussing the cases. It'll be something like this. It'll be, hey, Joaquin, come here. Can you take a look at this? Or he'll call me over and say, can you take a quick look at this x-ray? And so our learning ourselves, our learning is at a very high rate. We feel like we are constantly learning um, and that, that allows us to eventually understand more and diagnose more and deliver more care to patients that otherwise might not have been able to be treated. 
Oh, that's wonderful. I love that description because it not only sort of um, encompasses the Mayo model of care that we call on each other, and I can call on either of you if I have a question, you can call on me if you have a pain question, but we do the same in the pain clinic and we uh, constantly challenge each other to be, to take better care of our patients and to learn more. So I love that. Tell me a little about how um, telemedicine has impacted your practice and how particularly it's impacted um, the patient's experience of uh, their visits with you? Well, um, should I go first, uh, if you like? Sure, I can. Um, perfect. The, um, the, the, the timing of telemedicine with COVID was quite, uh, quite interesting because we had been developing for quite some time and uh, Joaquin and another partner of ours, Mark Mori and I, we'd been working on tools that we were developing and validating and publishing these validated tools for not what we called telemedicine at the time, but distant or remote medicine. And so the timing was such that we were already in a mindset of, of trying to figure out how to do some of our work from a distance. Because with this tertiary practice that we have, we would operate on a patient and, and sometimes they'll end up taking a flight the next day or sometime thereafter back across the country or possibly even to another country. And it's very difficult to have them come back for follow-up. So two things end up slipping in that scenario. One is that we don't have quite the quality control data to know how we're doing uh, that we would if the patient was right close by. And secondly, they don't have quite the sense of connection with their treating team of doctors and, and therapists and so on that they would if they were right nearby. So what we We've been able to do with telemedicine, it's been a real blessing for our practice and for the patients, is to really focus on the connection. So as we all know, as you know, we know, the relationship between a patient and a doctor or their team is, is so, so critical to everything and certainly the success of their treatment. So this allows us to really build on that connection, that feeling of being connected. So now patients, I think, feel much more connected to us we're able to get the information and keep getting the follow-up information. So our quality control level has gone up as a result of this, which is really, really good. And I think we'll be able to um, advance this, not just in the pre-operative and post-operative level, but with assessing patients who are completely new to us. And that's where we're moving into now, where we're doing consultations on patients from anywhere in the world um, who might be thinking of perhaps coming to Mayo Clinic for their care. And we can now offer them something more than just a vague email uh, response to their inquiry. So Joaquin, my husband is about to have a shoulder surgery with you in July. And I, so I've been in the office when you uh, examined him. Can you actually see a patient on a virtual visit and decide whether they might be a surgical candidate or not? Um, surely well, the physical exam must be compromised. Yeah, for the most part, uh, yes. You know, orthopedic surgery, I think, is a perfect specialty for evaluation of new patients. So telemedicine, like Sean was just mentioning, because typically on a screen, patients can show you many things that are of huge value for examination. For example, I could ask a patient, show me where you have the most severe pain and with a fingertip, show me if it's more here or here or here. So you as an examiner are showing the patients what to do and they can easily replicate it. Then for range of motion of the shoulder, which is very important for us, you can tell them, okay, show me you can get your hand all the way up in the air, or can you get it all the way out to the side, all the way behind your back? You can actually have some tests that the patient can do on himself. So there's one called the um, O'Brien's test, for example, for the labrum, where you can have the patient actually place the hand in front of them and turn it, and they can push the same the self down and see they have pain on the top of the shoulder. Or Dr. Disco designed the so-called hook test for the biceps. You can instruct the patient easily on a screen so how to do it. Obviously, there are some tests that cannot be done on a self-assessment of the patient, but many can. And the other thing with telemedicine is that with a screen sharing, you know, you can then very quickly pull up their x-rays. You can mm -hmm. annotate on the x-rays. You can pull their CT scans. You can show them where the problem is. You can show the MRI where the tendon there is. And then you can flip maybe to some page on information where you can show a picture of the surgery, the mobilizers that are going to use and so on. The other thing, Elena, is that uh, our patients do need to come for surgery, right? So we still have the chance to see them at least once before the operation and confirm everything that we gathered on the screen. But I've been very impressed with the ability to assess patients properly, even new patients through telemedicine. Are there limitations that you're finding to uh, the assessment other than what you described 
um, needing to see them ultimately in the office. I think the main limitations are a few specific tests that can only be done if you have the patient face to face. And also, like Dr. Disco mentioned, there is something special about the patient doctor relationship that I think benefits from a human face to face interaction. But we're very lucky because since we need to do surgery hands on, at least so far, we don't have remote surgery yet, maybe one day. Um, then we get the chance to confirm everything we suspected on a true physical examination and then get to meet the patient. But once you have that relationship, it is very easy to maintain through follow-up uh, appointments through telemedicine uh, as time goes by. Sean, one of the advantages that I have often thought about when I've thought about the telemedicine visits is our ability to reach patients who we otherwise <clears throat> might not. In other words, someone might not consider coming to Mayo Clinic because they'd have to get on a plane, uh, come halfway around the world or come across the United States or drive a great distance. And so they can have an initial consult and see whether um, this is the, this is, uh, there's something to offer them here. Are there other significant advantages uh, to patients um, using an initial like telemedicine visit? Yes, Helena, I, I was thinking that same uh, same scenario. So I think that the the advantages to patients are really going to be the driving forces behind this. And I think of the the key advantages, which you know you've really just summarized there, being those that relate to access, to convenience, and to cost. And they might sound like they're all the same, but 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 any one of those might be a a key limiting factor for a patient. So access. There are some patients who just would not be able to travel. It wouldn't matter if they had the money or the time, they would not be able to travel to Mayo Clinic. And now they would be able to have a consultation. So that, that's a really, I think, a big, big advantage for those patients. They might learn that it becomes worthwhile to, to make that travel in some sort of way that is made possible if they're they were assured of being able to be treated, where they might be able to now be diagnosed and then referred to somebody nearby who then can treat uh, the patient adequately. And the other is, uh, as I mentioned, is a convenience. Um, there are convenience factors such as kids needing to get out of school and missing school, uh, people missing work, missing sometimes a couple of days of work just to travel to Mayo Clinic have your studies, have your consultation and get back home. And, and all of these convenience factors are typically associated with cost as well. So the cost of care, whether it's a plane or gasoline or parking or hotel bills or food bills, the cost of care is, is ultimately going to be reduced with telemedicine as well, I see. So um, when we put all those together, I, I really do see this as being a real advantage to patients. and. Ultimately, I think um, one of the advantages, like you mentioned or asked about, you know, in comparison to just coming here, one of the advantages is that we get a real sense for the patient before they get here. So as Joaquin was mentioning, you know, we do this exam on the patient uh, and we feel like we're face to face, like I feel I'm, you know, talking with you right now, uh, even though we're in different rooms. Well, well, we get a sense that we've connected with the patient and we get a sense of what's going on with the patient. When they arrive, it's not completely new and fresh. Sometimes a patient arrives and we think to ourselves, oh, this is a little different than we thought. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's this big change of plans. We're scrambling to get consultations with other specialists, maybe change surgical plans, get a new study that normally you might need a week to book. And now we're trying to get it today or tomorrow. And that's a, a burden to the system and perhaps to the patient too. So now that when they come there, we're very prepared. We know exactly what we're going to be doing. And we get to meet eye to eye and carry on with the plan. Rarely do we have these completely unexpected changes of plans now. So I see it as a silver lining, as you said at the beginning. I think those are wonderful points, um, Sean. Uh, one of the things that I have often thought about, you know, our primary value here at Mayo Clinic is that the needs of the patient come first. Mm -hmm. And I've always been struck by the burden that people must bear in needing to pay for a hotel, needing to get out of work and bring someone else with them who also has to, to be out of work in many uh, situations, but uh, just the cost and the burden of that. Uh, Joaquin, yeah. when someone comes here for surgery, is there a typical amount of time if they're having a shoulder surgery or an elbow surgery that they're typically committing to coming uh, to the clinic for um, once they arrive? 
So like uh, Sean just mentioned, if we have already seen the patient through telemedicine, we can anticipate all their needs. For example, there may be a patient that in order to perform the surgery properly, you need two or three imaging studies, or they are uh, you know, sicker, they have a heart disease or a liver condition and need to see a specialist in that regard. So if we can plan in advance, oftentimes three days is enough. Like a patient can come on a Tuesday and if everything is on the schedule, between eight and five is incredible how many services Mayo Clinic can offer. The following day, they go to the hospital, have the operation. Many times we do now the surgery as outpatient or same day discharge. Maybe they stay one extra day in Rochester just for safety reasons or comfort, and then can go out the following day. Going back to the cost question, if someone has to come first for an appointment, that's one expense. Mm -hmm. Then for the surgery, that's another time of airfare, hotel, meals, parking, and so on. And then for follow up two or three times, it's not that you're paying the same expense once, it's maybe five times. Whereas now people are willing to spend that money because they come in just for the surgery. And when they come, everything is perfectly organized, no surprises, and then the follow-ups can be done through telemedicine, especially if we have partners in other parts of the country. Well, that's wonderful. Well, silver linings, this certainly sounds like one. Uh, tell me, uh, each of you, maybe we'll start with you, Sean, but what do you see as the future for telemedicine? Where do we go from here? Well, yeah, it's hard to predict the future, isn't it? Um, I think we're going to see, as, as has happened with technology in other areas, I think we're going to see a kind of a softening or a blending or a melting away of boundaries or limitations that used to exist. Uh, I think back to when I was young, there was no such imagination as talking to somebody and seeing their face at the same time. Right. That was something that was imagined. Like the Jetsons. You know? um, <laughs> but I do, I do see that the delivery of care elsewhere will start to come into this as well. So for example, um, currently, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do teaching here, Joaquin and Mark and I and our partners, we'll do teaching, we'll do live surgery and it'll be being watched by people around the world, 40 countries. Um, we actually have delved into teaching whereby we will have one person teaching, uh, for example, just last month, one person, well, earlier this month, teaching from England, doing a cadaveric dissection, while somebody right here in our lab is being instructed and following and executing, and the people around the world are watching this person learn. So it'll really impact how we teach these things Isn't as well. But ultimately, what I'm excited about is it will be able to be in the operating rooms, as surgeons say, in the operating rooms and guiding surgeons in Ethiopia and Kenya and Guinea and so on. Right now, we do that kind of by email and by, um, you know, less immediate and less direct means. Mm -hmm. But I do see that in the future, we'll be doing it a lot more like we'll be, I will be looking, you'll have your patient right there. And we say, okay, make a decision. No, I would go just two centimeters lateral. Okay, right there. Now go for five centimeters proximal that, okay, right there. That's where you're going to find the median nerve. I say, oh yeah, it's right here. Good. And, and that's just going to be another level that um, I see naturally uh, developing. That's incredible. Joaquin, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, it is pretty clear to me, at least, that telemedicine is here to stay for the reasons that we discussed uh, in this conversation amongst the three of us. And then if you power it even further with my wearable technology, where people can have a smart watch or something that can monitor their vitals, or like a smart thing we've been thinking about that kind of remind patients how to do range of motion exercises, technology has been growing so fast in everything that we do. If you think about your car, your cell phone, your house, so many things are internet enabled or the smart appliances, that's gonna transpire into the future of medicine for sure. And I think we will make healthcare more affordable for many patients, but they will still get the best care when they need it. So I think it's here to stay and I'm actually very excited about it. I think this is absolutely fascinating. Another silver lining, I think the pandemic the sharing of information back and forth across the world as far as the development of vaccines and the knowledge that increased and now seeing that applied into other specialties of medicine uh, as we're increasing our ability to rapidly uh, share information and that's just amazing. Yeah, I agree. Good news for our patients, that's for sure. Well, no thank problem. you both for being here today. Thank, thank you very much, Lena. What a pleasure.
I yeah. so enjoyed this conversation and our thanks to Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeons, Dr. Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo and Dr. Sean O'Driscoll for being here today to talk to us about telemedicine and how that's being applied not only in orthopedics and orthopedic surgery, but in many areas of medicine. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And we wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.